All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to my talk uh, about building rednosday.com on Drupal 8. Um, I probably should be giving this talk with this Red Nose Day on my face. <laughs> However, <laughs> I've actually tried talking, but it's very uncomfortable, so I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, talk a bit about our story um, with building probably one of the bigger sites in the UK on Drupal 8. Um, and actually, I'm not just going to talk about the site, but I'm rather going to talk about the products we've built in the process that is now powering uh, Red Nose Day Um The site went live um, already last year, in June 2015, when we actually set off with our fundraising campaign. And we've been adding new features um, over the course of the months, um, kind of building up to Red Nose Day, uh, which is going to happen in just a couple of weeks now. Um, so just a little bit about, I don't know, maybe somebody who hasn't heard of Comic Relief in this room. Everyone knows Comic Relief? Wow. So <laughs> I guess I can skip my, my first slide then. Um, but I just, I just mentioned that it is. Um, so Comic Relief is um, a charity in the UK, and we strive to create a just world uh, free from poverty. Um, we do that mainly by organizing two uh, fundraising campaigns. Um, the most famous one is Red Nose Day, Red Nose Day and the other one is uh, Sport Relief. Um, and we kind of alternate. One year we organize Red Nose Day, the other year we organize um, Sport Relief. And, um, we use the money we raise during these events um, in all sorts of ways, but we mainly focus on funding projects in the UK, around 50%, and the other 50% we fund projects in Africa. So we kind of um, fundraising the money, then working with charities on the ground to distribute the money, the money back and try to do, to do good in the world. And um, we use the power of our brand to raise awareness of uh, the issues that we care most about. Um, we work a lot with celebrities here in the UK um, to kind of get our message across. Um, let me just say a couple of words about uh, myself. Um, I'm currently tech lead at Comic Relief. I've been there for about a year and a half. Um, and you can read about all our technology stories at our technology blog. Um, we don't just write about Drupal, we also write about everything that inspires us to build uh, kind of digital products to help uh, us um, reach our, our mission and our vision. I'm also the founder of a, of a small consultancy company, digital uh, tech shop uh, called Marzi Labs. Uh, we've been doing Drupal for, I think, about at least five years. Um, based in Barcelona, we've got offices in, in, in Portugal and also here in the UK. And I'm a long-time Drupal contributor, so I've been, I've been working with Drupal, you know, since 4.6. I, I can't count uh, the number of times I swear to Drupal in, in these the long 10 years. And I've, I've been, I've had ups and downs with Drupal, probably like all of you. I've been tired of Drupal, I've been excited again about Drupal, and now I'm kind of, I'm kind of currently at the mood where I'm pretty excited about where we're heading with, with Drupal, and especially with Drupal, Drupal 8. Um, so let me tell, tell you a little bit about uh, Drupal at Comic Relief. Um, we've been using, or better, Comic Relief has been using Drupal um, for at least four years now, five years. Um, we started um, launching ComicRelief.com on, on Drupal 7 back in 2014. The work started uh, already a while before that. And uh, we, gr we, we were a different team back then. We were working uh, very often with like contractors, outside um, firms that helped us build our, our, our sort of our web presence. And our code base kind of gradually evolved uh, with that as well. So then come 2015, uh, we launched a rednosday.com website um, on Drupal 7. Um, we actually coupled the code bases of ComicRelief.com and RedNoseDay.com together, so we were actually using uh, multi-site support in Drupal 7 that, I don't know if anyone uh, actually uh, used it before, but if you haven't, never use it. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> don't think about it. It's wrong. <coughs> um, um, 
And the reason why it's wrong is that when we actually um, started building the website for Sports Relief, our Sports Relief campaign last year, uh, in 2016, we tried initially building this from scratch, again, kind of with best practices in place and all this kind of stuff. Didn't really work out, so we reverted to our pattern that was kind of working, which was the multi-site, and we put Sport Relief on the same code base as Red Nose Day uh, 2015 and Comic Relief, um, which led to a whole amount of problems, most notably when you put three different sites on the same code base, um, your destiny is bound as well. So if you change something, one, one little thing we started changing in, in 2016, was um, responsive um, image support, right? So we wanted to use source set and all these kind of cool responsive things. Uh, so using the picture version 2 module of, uh, that's available uh, in Drupal. Now, unfortunately, ComicReed.com was using the version 1 of the module. So we were thinking, oh, that's fine. we we'll just upgrade to version 2. Well, that didn't work out. <laughs> we actually broke uh, our backwards compatibility quite badly. So we went in and started forking uh, the module and put uh, our modules for support relief in separate folders in our code base. Now, you can imagine that as time progresses, new features were added. That was kind of the norm. We were starting to fork our code base um, to support all these three different sites up to the point we couldn't really maintain it anymore. So um, we were feeling like this. <laughs> we want to give up, right? Uh, we just wanted to get the site out um, in, in whatever form or way uh, possible. Now, come 2017, or actually end of 2015, when we started to think about our 2017 campaign, we thought we need to radically change here something. We need to build a technology that can actually help us um, power all the fundraising sites we need to develop over the course of the years. So we started, um, we started fresh. Um, at the time, end of 2015, Drupal 8 had just barely come out uh, in the first stable release. Uh, so that definitely kind of um, uh, caught, our, caught our interest, right? Um, but before, before I start talking about Drupal 8, yes? Okay. Sure, I can do that. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be very close to you guys with the mic here. <laughs> if I shout, please <laughs> tell me. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Yeah. Great. Um, so we need a fresh start, right? Um, so a fresh start of what? I mean, first of all, what 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 is it that we want to? So we want to build a campaign website, right, to support our fundraising campaign. Um, but actually, that's not entirely accurate. Rather than building a campaign site, we want to build a product that can build us campaign sites. That's not entirely accurate either, because we actually want to build a product that allows editors or our editorial team, which is a brilliant team of, 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 of people we have at Comic Relief, to reorganize raw components or sort of layouts in the website to build our fundraising website. And we want to be able to continuously iterate over our, over our code base. We want to not be bound by choices we made two years back when we look at uh, the next fundraising campaign we are organizing. So the main theme, I guess, of my talk here is how we build such a product what that product is. So here are just a couple of, of elements that I think are important when you think about such product. So first of all, the product should support iterative development. We should be able to add in a new feature and then uh, swap it out for another feature or work on the second version of that feature uh, for the next campaign in iterations without having to start from, st uh, from a fresh start new every single time you, you do some development. Second of all, um, you need to support sort of a clear versioning scheme. So we need to know that that product is uh, version 1 or version 2 or version 1.25.3. Uh, much like Drupal, Drupal Core, that we know we're using that version of Drupal Core, 
so we can rely on all the, the functionalities provided by that specific version. Uh, we use semantic versioning for everything, uh, which is something that that isn't often done when you actually build a website, uh, but it's definitely a great way for us to, to kind of organize our, our products. Um, you also need to guarantee the quality of your product. So how you can do that? Well, we all know we need to write tests, right? Tests are often a thing that you want to do, but you don't. <laughs> because there's no time, because the client is not paying for the tests. Well, I can tell you that this. If you're going to build a product, and you're not going to build any tests, you better do something else. Because you need to have tests to ensure the quality at every given step um, of, of your product development. And you need to understand the impact of every change you introduce to your code base um, and have tests sort of backing up there. Finally, for us, um, very important, we needed a sensible default for every given campaign. Now, sort of unfortunately, we only organize one campaign a year, so we only need to make that start once a year. I've always thought if you were to do a campaign every month and we need a new website, a new brand, a new logo, all these kind of things, a new, a new product, things would be easier because we will be more geared towards um, kind of churning out these websites in, in, in a more efficient manner. Um, so when we're starting to think about our next campaign, we want to be ready and build that website in a month's time. And finally, we need to allow for some customization, right? We need to be able uh, that that's when, when, a, when a fundraising campaign needs to collect uh, data from a user or, or, or anything else, we need to be able to allow the product um, to... to um, we, need, we need to um, have the ability in the code base to be able to, to do these things without having to think about backwards compatibility. Um, so a little bit about technology choice. Um, it won't surprise you that we chose Drupal 8. <laughs> um, but we, we mainly chose Drupal 8 because it's embracing industry PHP standards. Everyone's talking about PHP FIG. Um, the standards we've adopted as a community. And this is probably the greatest thing about Drupal 8. At least for me, um, choosing the right technology. And the reason is that very often in a large organization such as Comic Relief, you're not just doing one website. You're building a whole ecosystem of websites and applications that work together. Now, we use PHP for a lot of other things as well. We built a whole microservices architecture, uh, for example, for uh, giving pages. Um, or, or we built uh, an application to declare your gift dates. These are all using PHP standards. So it's for us very important that our product is tied in um, or, or our website can reuse these same standards and we can actually start to swap technology between them. Build on top of Symfony, use of Twig, Composer, all these great things. And editorial features out of the box which are very important because we actually want to build these landing pages. Accessibility, there is, there was a great talk I think today as well about accessibility, that's really important for us. We want, um, we want your, the website to be accessible by as many users as possible, or machines, right? Building REST capabilities, and finally, a development challenge. And at some point in 2015, we, when we were weighing our options, we said, okay, we've got to make a decision. We've got to have this side out in a couple of months. So. Let's not think it over too much and just, you know, dive into the codes. So, what are these ingredients that I think are very important to build our, our products? We focused on three things and I'll talk, I try to talk as, uh, about all of this in, in depth uh, later. First of all, focus on editorial experience, automate and streamline, and then think decoupled, decoupled services. So, um, I'll start off with editorial experience. Um, we're building a website that uh, is supporting our fundraising campaign. So for us, 
engaging landing pages that are beautiful, that are accessible, that are responsive, that are managed by our team of editors is sort of the norm, is the baseline of what a website should look like for us. So we started really focusing on that. Um, in the first iteration, and we started using panels with Panelizer. Um, I don't know, has anyone used panels, Panelizer? Most people, are you still using it now? Nobody. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, it was our first iteration, uh, and, and, and it's, it's a great set of modules. Unfortunately for us, it, it, the modules give just too much uh, custom options for our editors, so it becomes, becomes very difficult to manage. So our second iteration was using panels, panelizer, and then embedded paragraphs. So we, 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 we're still working around the concept of nodes, but it can be extended with panels. And then as part of the nodes, we have embedded paragraphs. That was already slightly better, but at some point we realized, actually, we're not using panelizer. <coughs> we're not using panels, so why keep it? Why not just go all the way and use paragraphs? So we ended up using paragraphs to build our landing pages and use block reference, a paragraph block reference, um, to reference bits of the website that are less easily editorially customizable, such as a sign-up form, or something that's provided by custom PHP codes. But still, we wanted to give the editors the flexibility to reference these kind of blocks through a paragraph block reference. So this is kind of, this is our model of the website. Very simple. You have your header, your menu, and then you have your notes with your different paragraphs uh, in there. And these are the kind of paragraph types we've been developing over, over the, past, uh, the past year. Cards, quotes, block reference, a content wall with, um, with where, where different cards can be positioned in different, uh, in different constellations. And also things like embeds functionality that I'll talk a bit later about. And the main thing, and then we, we use a library of blocks these can be editorial blocks, um, um, custom blocks like email sign-up that are reusable. Because the main difference between paragraphs and blocks are that paragraphs are kind of hard tied into your notes. While you have a series of blocks that are reusable, you can actually build that library and have the editor kind of work with that library of blocks independent of a page. So we transitioned sort of to a landing page builder where certain elements are usable and certain elements are not. And that kind of really worked well for us. Uh, coming from a model where we built everything always on a page level and very specific to that page. Um, this is kind of an overview of blocks, paragraphs, and we ended up using blocks for all the contents and paragraphs for lots of the layout. And then we use just a reference from one to the other um, to kind of make the connection. Paragraphs are only editable uh, in the notes, um, while blocks are editable everywhere with quick edits, uh, with contextual links, and all the kind of nice things that Drupal, Drupal 8 gives you pretty much out of the box. Um, the second part of thinking in paragraphs is that um, you actually, when you start thinking in, in, in pages that are composed of blobs, of paragraph blobs of uh, data, you can actually think in the display of these independent from your Drupal website. And actually you can create something which is often referred to as a living style guide. And that's a really powerful way for us to, have to build a website. Um, because basically, what you start doing is you work on your CSS, your SAS, um, separately from Drupal in your theme. Um, you have your, your, uh, your little blob of, of, of HTML corresponding to your, to your SAS. And then you automatically generate this, 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 this style guide. So, um, Everyone, I think, understands style guides in the context of like typography, 
button styles, all this kind of stuff. But actually, we ended up building all our row components, all our paragraph types, in the style guides. This is one example of the row components we built. Is we call it a story <coughs> row components, and it's basically a way for for our editor to say, so much money was raised. That's the effect you've made uh, by raising that money. Um, and we've built this component entirely outside of our Drupal uh, installation first. We can do a QA process on these components, test, all the, test, test the components and its behavior on the different devices um, before, before actually going into any Drupal builds. And this is another uh, example of a, of, a, of a row component, or a paragraph, whatever you want to call it. And you create this automatic style guide um, with all the different row components uh, outside this composer. So, living style guide, how we've done that? Well, we use something that's, that's been around for quite a while now. It's called KSS, Nile Style Sheets. Style sheets. And basically, KSS is documentation syntax for, for CSS. So when you write your CSS, you annotate your CSS, and that these annotations are picked up by KSS and automatically generated into, <coughs> into your living style guide. And this resulted in an incubation area for us to trial new row components, to trial new ways of laying out our page, which was great. Code and style guides are one, no need to update one or the other independently, and thus guaranteeing your style guide stays fresh. And, and we've, we've had great success with that, up to the point that our partners that are also building websites with our kind of theme and, and our front-end components are reusing the same components elsewhere. <coughs> so this is kind of the process we followed for making these landing pages. We had a component idea, work through the component in the style guides, HTML, SATS, and JavaScript. Do a series of review, multi-device testing, QA, sign-off, <coughs> before going into actual Drupal developments. Um, and then the Drupal development is pretty standard. You define your content model, your fields, your view modes. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and you package it up in, into what we call a component module. And then you work um, any custom logic in there using uh, PHP. Um, I'm not sure you can, you'll be able to see much of this. Let's try. But this is our improved editor experience. We've actually asked our editors to make a screen cap of using the Rhinos Day 2017 site and the 2015 site. Here we're fiddling with panels, uh, page manager pages, mini panels, um, I don't know, all, all kind of panels, variants that have been around boxes, blocks, uh, and it's, it's usually, it's very difficult for editors to, to deal with that. While on the other, uh, well, the, the, the Drupal 8 side, um, using just a simple paragraph concept was actually pretty easy. And editors are, of course, much happier and can thus build more engaging uh, pages for our users. Um, this is just um, an overview of how these different row components all compose together and are shown on the page here. This is the story uh, component I showed you before in the style guide. Here it is in, in, in an actual page. Um, the email sign-up block, I'll talk a bit more about how that works, but that's one of these custom blocks that we control. Um, an editor can create these blocks, um, but they have certain backend logic associate them that editors cannot control. But they can kind of organize the layout within the page. Um, see how I meet the time? I think I, I'm okay. So the next part of this talk uh, is about automating and streamlining everything. Um, how many of you have tried to build your website in one step? Or know about the built in one step? Um, concept. Nobody? So, um, a building one step is, 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 really, is a really powerful way of thinking about your website. So if anyone can build your website in one step, you can start automating stuff that 
comes after that, right? So in our case, we're using the, the, the concept of an installation profile in Drupal that's been around in Drupal since, <coughs> I think, at least Drupal 6. And we're using um, CMI, so Content Management Initiative, uh, Configuration Management initi Initiative, rather, to kind of have your Drupal settings stored in files, right? <coughs> and um, we use a module called Config Develop to kind of package up our configuration related to a paragraph type or a node type, put this in a, in a module and kind of manage it in that module directly. Um, I don't think I have the time to kind of dive into this uh, entirely, but uh, I'll be happy to talk more about, about how we work with Config Develop uh, after the talk. <coughs> Important if you want to have a build in one step and kind of install your sites in one step is that you have some default content, right? Because you want to have a good start of any website. So we store our default content in JSON. We use the default content module, which is really great. <coughs> and basically serializes your nodes, your paragraph types, and your blocks in, in JSON. <coughs> um, and then you need to use some sort of a build tool. Um, so we use um, Thing, which is a PHP build tool um, that's been around for quite a while. It has, honestly, a horrible syntax. <laughs> it's using XML for everything. Uh, we're not used to write XML anymore, um, but it does the job. And um, we might be replacing this soon with Composer or with NPM or whatever kind of more modern build tools are around. Um, and we build, we run Thing Builds often. Uh, Thing Builds basically installs the whole website from scratch um, and allows you to start customizing it further. Um, this is an example of, of, of some of the modules um, uh, we have in our, in our profile. This is cards. This is one of these row components we have. Um, basically, all the modules are very simple. They contain uh, an info YAML file, which references all the pieces of config this module exports. Then dot module file, which is very often empty, and then the config install directory at the top, which actually contains the YAML uh, config exports. <coughs> um, the next part in kind of automating our, our workflow is we need to find we need to have a way to expose the code that's being written and that different developers are working on. So I think this is kind of the norm these days, but we use GitHub for everything. We use a typical Git flow model with a master, develop, and then feature branches uh, that work that work off there. Um, I really like um, to go in in the morning and browse through all the different pull requests that have been made in the past day or so. Uh, it's a great way to keep up to date with what developers are writing. And it's a great way to have different people talking to each other that otherwise wouldn't necessarily, necessarily talk to each other. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do now is as well to get non-technical people involved in our GitHub process. Because that can actually help a lot to avoid a lot of problems we would otherwise face down the road. Um, now talk a little bit about uh, tests. Um, there's no automation without tests, right? So what kind of tests are we doing to ensure the quality of our builds? We do a lot of things like code sniffer, PHP mess detection, or code beautifier that run at the first step when the developer is working on the code. And then we do configuration checks using config develop, making sure that our configuration is consistent with what the module describes it should be. Then we do sort of a distribution installation test using Fig Build. We need to make sure that um, our distribution, our campaign profile distribution is actually installing fine. There's no errors in the, in the installation. If not, it, this test will fail. And then we do behavior tests um, using BHAT. And I'll show one of the tests um, uh, later. We also do things like every single time a developer commits something to the code base, we do log checks. Um, that's something that's often forgotten, but is the greatest pain six months into a life site because your logs are exploding, 
and you simply do not have the time to fix them. So since we're installing our site continuously over and over again, and we're actually simulating the, editor, the editorial behavior using BHATS and kind of this behavior driven testing, we can actually see whether during all these actions we perform on the website, we actually generate any error logs or warnings or whatever. And if there is one warning, the build will fail and the developer won't be able to commit uh, his or her code. And then we're, we're, this is very experimental still, but we're starting a visual regression test where we actually try to kind of compare previous and next version of the codes visually and kind of compare the difference in percentage of either two websites uh, using an open source tool from the BBC it's called BBC Wave. Um, this is one of the BHA tests um, we, have, we have written. I'm not sure you can read it, but basically it simulates the creation of a landing page from the perspective of an editor. So you create a landing page, you add a number of paragraphs, and then you basically assert that whatever you expect to see is present on the page. So if the developer um, changes one of the paragraph types, this test will fail. Is anyone, has anyone seen BHAT before? Um, is anyone not doing BHAT yet? Okay, uh, <laughs> start doing BHAT, it will save your life. I mean, it's, it's immense. All the kind of actions you would be doing through the UI, you can write this in BHAT. It takes a little bit of time to get used to it, but Drupal has great support, and I even think that Drupal Core is gonna adopt BHAT as a testing methodology. I'm not sure when this will happen, but that's, that would be great. Now, um, testing is pretty much useless if you don't continuously check for that, right? So we use Travis um, as our continuous integration tool. So we built, we built our code base on every single commit uh, that the developer makes in every single pull request that's being made uh, to our stable branch. And some fail, some don't, but we, we always know that if it fails, it won't be allowed to merge in the stable branch, so it cannot generate any problems. Um, kind of the last part of, of automation or our, the way we work with our code is preview branches, which is something, and I'm aware I'm like throwing a lot of different topics around, but they all kind of fit within our model of, of creating this collaborative environment of building products. And I think preview branches is often not talked about enough. Um, but there's actually great tools available um, right now in Drupal lands, one of them being platform message. Um, so basically what you do, every time uh, somebody commits something uh, to a feature branch, we rebuild the site from scratch um, and show this on a preview environment. Um, we also do something more, which is every time you open a pull request, you build a site from scratch. Every time you commit to that same pull request, we just import the configuration. This is so we speed up uh, the actual preview of the site. If not, you have to wait every time 10 minutes for your site to, to build. This has saved us a lot of times, and we're using it in all our processes. We're using it to QA, QA new versions of the site, um, to test out new things, to experiment with new things, and, and it saved an enormous amount of time. Then, um, and I think I have another five minutes, ten minutes. Um, the final part, sort of what is important when you build such a product, is to think decoupled. We all have heard about probably about microservices. Uh, we all want to use them. Uh, but in Drupal, um, in Drupal and often microservices are thought about as headless Drupal, right? You separate your backend from your frontend. Well, while this might be right, then you would miss on all, all, all of the front-end tools that Drupal gives you, like Twig, or when you build paragraphs, uh, how you're going to separate this front from back. So that, that's not a way for us that that, that would work or make sense. Um, okay, um, <laughs> this is a slightly different topic, but I really like this slide when I saw it, because it basically means the more code you write, the more errors you get times two. <laughs> So we try to limit our custom codes all the time. 
We're using Drupal, we're using contributed modules, so there's no point of us writing a lot of custom code, right? Um, basically, we minimize our, our custom code. I think I've actually went through our code base and we have around 2,000 custom PHP lines to power redmosday.com right now. Um, and these are mostly sort of what we call glue code. We write a lot of glue code. Well, not a lot because we only wrote 2,000 lines. And then all the non-glue codes, we, we kind of package this up and contribute this back in the form of a module. So we've done, we've contributed two modules for this project, RabbitMQ and social links. Um, so how do we minimize the custom code? So we basically use two patterns to minimize our custom code. One is what we call the embed pattern. Uh, in this case, this is a page with a kids game. You can find it at rednosedatacom slash kids. And the embed pattern is used to kind of integrate a third party website or application via a block, usually through uh, an iframe, into our website. So that's one way to decouple uh, two distinct, uh, these different services into one website. Uh, but the other pattern we use a lot is the queue pattern. And I, has, anyone, has anyone heard about queues <coughs> and why they would be used? Uh, so basically, a queue, you have a producer, you have a queue, the producer continuously dumps data into the queue, and then on the other, on the other hand of the queue, you have a consumer that kind of picks up elements from that queue and does something with them. The easiest example for us, in our use case, is an email list subscription, right? We want to gather people's email addresses um, for a newsletter or, or, or whatever, and, and, and mail to them and add them to our address book. So, in this case, our producer is our Drupal website. Um, our queue holds the email addresses, um, things like a template ID, and, and everything required for the consumer or the processor to do something useful with that, <coughs> such as sending out an email to the user that just subscribed. Now, you might think, use the MailChimp module in Drupal, right? I mean, that's what, it, that's what it's useful for. However, if you think like this, you're going to hard couple MailChimp and Drupal together. In our case, we don't, we don't care about who's going to do something with the logic with, or with the data we push to the queue. In fact, we have a service um, that gathers the email addresses, uh, stored in the queue, and then sends them out using, uh, first of all, the email addresses stored in our internal warehousing, and then it's also sent out using a service called Smart Focus to the user to lock them. Um, as a result, um, our custom code um, in, on the Drupal site is limited to just drop something in the queue. And for this purpose, we wrote the RabbitMQ module. Uh, and RabbitMQ being um, sort of the main, one of the main uh, messaging, queue messaging uh, systems around there. I don't think I have time to go through the codes, so I'll just um, go through there. Um, but basically, we're actually moving towards microservices by starting to decouple logic like that. And we, we haven't even talked about headless, right? So we use OMBAT, iFrame for integrating third, third party apps into our website. And we use message queues for decoupling um, logic of two things that don't make sense to actually be together. That's a very powerful system for building microservices because then you can work on your different software components independently from each other. So now you might wonder, we built, we built a product with these characteristics. What about rednosday.com, right? So rednosday.com is currently using version 1.36. Of, of this uh, distribution we've built. Um, Comicplay.com, we're currently porting this over to the distribution as well. And Sporterleague.com might, for example, use version 2 of, of our distribution. So we actually have, through our version management, we have the power to kind of change things under the hood without having to worry too much about breaking three sites at the same time. And uh, Redmosday.org, that's our, our, our sister campaign in the USA, is also going to reuse our same code base. Um, and they're currently working on this right now. 
Um, I don't think I'm going to go in detail because I'm, I think I have a couple of minutes left. So I'll leave some time for questions. But this is kind of how we deal with config uh, and kind of uh, deal with building Red Nose data com on the campaign distribution. So, questions? <laughs> yes? Um, they typically stay around until, so the question was how long do these campaign sites kind of live or stay around for? And that they, they really stay around for about two years when they're replaced by the next campaign because Red Nose Day, Red Nose Day is every two years, Sports Release every other two years. Um, and we're starting to archive this uh, right now on 2015.rednoseday.com. So you kind of see our previous campaigns. Yes. For the um, Star Wars, yes. Um, you mentioned that you developed a lot of the uh, markup uh, in the end of the day and then you then reduced it to your book, uh, to your book. So does that mean that you then customize a lot of the templates, uh, which would find what it means so you could use the book for the Right. So that's a very good question. And um, so the question is um, how do we deal? Uh, with our market when we develop in a style guide versus uh, our Drupal counterpart, let's say. Um, and we, we actually overwrite all our templates from scratch, so we use display suite for that. We, and we, we kind of map it one-to-one -one on the handlebar code snippet that I showed you before, which lives in a style guide. We're currently in the process of using Twig for this, so we can actually use the exact same uh, HTML for both. Uh, that's very experimental. There's a couple of KSS SOM support for Twig, um, but we haven't yet uh, made it uh, work together well. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely where we want to move this, so we reduce another step. And yes? Do you find you have to curate your components twice, one for the style and one for the software? Yes. <laughs> that's a short answer. You need to QA. The question is, do we need to? QA the components in the style guides and also again in the website. And actually, I must say, we're probably, we're probably QA them right now three times, which is once in the style guides, once in the distribution, and once in the website that's using the distribution. And the reason for that is that we're still kind of finding out where, what, uh, what, where needs to live where, uh, I guess. Um, but very often it's, it's not, there's a couple of integration issues and it's not, there's no really big problems um, with that, but we definitely need to be testing it still in, in different places uh, because of the surrounding uh, context. Any more questions? Yes. Good one. Um, on the use of paragraphs for making these landing pages, yeah. um, obviously over a long page, the, the end user experience flow is going to get very Absolutely. Do you have any tips for tidying up the stuff like that page? So the question is, how do you deal with very long paragraph uh, edit forms? The answer is, at least the answer for us is the use of blocks. Because blocks, um, while you reference them within the paragraph, you often wouldn't edit them within the notes or the, the, par the, the notes with the paragraphs. Uh, and with quick edits, so you will build your, your page, then you will just quick edit just the block. Uh, rather than going into the full you note know, edit form, which is a lot lighter uh, than doing that. I think there's also support, <coughs> they're starting to work on uh, quick edit support or, or inline edit support for paragraphs, but it's very experimental, I think. Uh, but that would probably do the same thing. And tidy up these long edit forms. Anyone else? There at the back, I think I have one more minute. So you just said a couple of modules of the project packs and you use yes. um, are you planning on contributing the whole distribution at all? Yes, and um, I deliberately left so the question is are we planning to 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 contribute to the whole distribution? I've deliberately left out one slide that I had prepared, uh, which is we're open sourcing all of this. <laughs> the reason I left it out is we're dealing with our legal team to make sure we can open source this. I wanted to kind of give it here at Drupal Camp, but um, it's going to come a little bit later. But definitely we want to contribute this to have everyone being involved in this, in this effort. One more question.
question there. how we separate paragraphs with, from blocks. And we actually also, I mean, both of them are content, right? Um, the reason is we put content lo uh, layout logic in a paragraph. For example, go left, go right, or image, big image on the left, text on the right, or the opposite. This kind of logic is in a paragraph. Then the block is basically just the content, which is often a title, um, an image, and some body text. So that's kind of how we separate it. It's, it's not referring to actually the layout of your Drupal website or your Twig or anything of that. It's still about content. But it's more for an editor. From an editor's point of view, they can use the same um, copy, editorial copy, but display it separately in the paragraph context. All right. Uh, I think that'll be it. Thank you very much for uh, for that. <laughs>